So I'm trusting that the word as is declared, that um, the word will go forth with living power and accomplish great things in our lives. Um, the word doesn't just make us comfortable, but the word also makes us conformable, makes us to conform to the image of Christ. So I'm trusting that as God prospers us, He's not just um, blessing us with material blessings, but He's blessing us in such a way that He's bringing us into more conformity with the image of Christ. So we imbibe more of Christ, and that also positively affects our character. So that whatever blessings God gives you, you have the commensurate Christ-like character to bear the blessings, the weight of the blessings. So I'm trusting that as we are proceeding on a daily basis with our broadcast, that is affecting us in such a way as to bring us into more conformity with the image of the Son of God. Hallelujah. I get really excited anytime we talk about grace because grace is not just a subject. Grace is a living personality. And that living personality is Christ. Christ is our grace. He's actually our grace. So you can actually hold him as the grace that's effectively at work in your life. It's exciting, we've been talking about this grace, but I want us to see how the grace of God actually was powerfully illustrated in the life of a young lady called Ruth. So I'm going to ask somebody to read from, for us from Ruth chapter 2, and we'll start from verse 1. Um, we're going to read a long passage, but um, it's just to give us a background to what we are going to talk about. So I'll be doing a lot of illustration today, but it's going to help you because some things inside of you will be activated. Hallelujah. Are you, are you all ready? It says, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's. Look at how the Bible describes him. A mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabites, said unto Naomi, her mother-in-law, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. She is actually anticipating and expecting grace. The mother-in-law that this Naomi said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap, it's like her lot, her lock, that's how it sounds, was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, just a minute, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab and she said 
I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and had continued even from the morning until now. And she tarried a little in the house. In other words, she rested for a short while and has been working almost all day. Then, just see what happens here. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not my daughter? Do not go not to glean in another field. Hmm. Neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let your eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? When thou art a thirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in your eyes that thou shouldest Take knowledge of me, see that I'm a stranger. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband. How thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knowest not heretofore. Verse 12, the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. So that's the testimony concerning Mo, uh, Ruth the Moabitish woman. He's, the testimony is, under whose wing thou art come to trust. In other words, the Lord God of Israel, she has come to trust under his wings. That's the testimony. Then said she, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me For that thou hast spoken friendly unto thy handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thy handmaids. I don't, I, I don't qualify. I don't look like them. They're a lot more better than me. They're superior to me. They're all looking good and, you know, healthy and all nice. But I am just coming from abject poverty. And Boaz said unto her, At meal time, come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. She sat, and she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did it, and was sufficed, and left. In other words, that word and let means, and there was left over. When she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men. Listen to this, church. Listen to this. Please listen to this. As soon as she had risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. Katari Let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her. In other words, purposely pour handfuls of grain for her. And leave them 
that's on her path, that she may glean them and don't rebuke her, rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out that she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up. <laughs> it's here. What? Okay, let me just continue. So I don't go ahead of myself. She took it up. She took it up and went into the city. And her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where rottest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, This man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who had not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, the man is next of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabites said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. In other words, don't go anywhere. Remain in this field and stay close to the young men. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field, that they meet you not in any other field, so she kept fast by the maidens, maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of harvest, barley harvest, and of wheat harvest, and dwelt with her mother-in-law. If you look at chapter 3, chapter 3, we're not going to read that for, for, for we're not going to read it, maybe we'll read it some other time, but it shows you how the workings of God brought, providence of God brought her to connect with Boaz as husband. But I want to share with us, you see, what we have just, um, what we've just read. We will see here a clear picture of the workings of the grace of God in the life of Ruth. And you see, when a lot of what we read in the Old Testament, a lot of it, we can see the New Testament hidden in the Old Testament. We can see pictures that are types of the real substance which is manifested in the New Testament. So the first thing we see here, let me just make a brief summary of what we talked about yesterday. You know, we're talking about grace. And we're, we're saying that there are two covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. And that what Christ has done for us is he's called the mediator of the new covenant. And that new covenant is premised on better promises. And Christ is the one that inaugurated it or ratified it by his own blood. And that's why when he takes the cup, he says, this, what does he say? He says, this is the cup of my covenant in my blood, of the new covenant in my blood. Or sometimes he says, this is the cup of my blood in the new covenant. So 
we're trying to explain to you the major difference between the new covenant and the old covenant. And except you understand the new covenant, you may not be able to maximally appropriate of the benefits in it. Now, the thing about the new covenant is that the blessings of the new covenant are almost too good to be true, to be true. But unfortunately, the eyes of many are blinded to the truth. Now, the key difference in the two covenants, and I want you to note this because if you grasp this, it will help you in your work in the New Testament. The basic difference is in the Old Testament, you are required to deploy your own efforts. Mama, please come and help us with this, Doug, please. You are required to deploy your own efforts to be able to benefit of the blessings of the Old Testament. That's why the Old Testament is called the Testament, the Covenant of the Law. The Covenant of the Law. It's governed by the law. And the way the law is structured, the law, the law says, if you will diligently hearken unto the commands of the Lord and obey his instructions, you will be blessed. Just a minute, just sorry, just a minute. Okay. Okay. If you will diligently hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, you will you will be blessed. If you don't, you'll be cursed. That's the testament. That's the old testament. So that puts the onus on you. That puts the pressure on you. It there it means for the Old Testament, the one who is able to, you know, deploy his effort, his self-effort, his self-energy, his self-diligence, and all that, is the one that will be blessed. However, if you don't obey, you are cursed. Now, in the New Testament, please note this, the obedience required to be blessed Christ accomplished it 100%. Which means the obedience of Christ secured the totality of, the, of every blessing that the law stipulated. Are you listening to me? The obedience of Christ secured the totality of all blessings in the new in the old testament all the blessings stipulated by the law christ's obedience secured it because his obedience was satisfactory and was perfect in the eyes of god the father are you hearing now as far as the curse is concerned christ also became your perfect substitute and all your sins your errors your disobedience your rebellion were laid upon him and he was chastised, condemned, and severely judged like he was you who had sinned. So the totality of the sins of humanity were laid upon him and he was cursed. And God, guess what? How you, how, guess how he was punished? He was punished on the tree because that was supposed to be a spiritual significance of being a curse. For you and me. In other words, he was extracted. He was sucking in and sucking away all the curses from you into himself. So what Jesus has done, Deuteronomy chapter 28, is Jesus has rewritten Deuteronomy 28 for you. How did he rewrite Deuteronomy 28? Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 to 14, has all the blessings. You'll be blessed in the city, you'll be blessed in the fields, you'll be blessed in your going out, you'll be blessed in your coming in, you'll be blessed in and out of season, you will be the head, not the tail, you'll be first, not the last. You know, all those blessings, it says that he will open the heavens, pour out rain upon you, everything you set out your hand to do, you will profit. 
In other words, every blessing he has secured in verses 1 to 14, he secured it for you. Then from verse 15 to verse 68 of Deuteronomy 28, it specifies all the curses that anyone who disobeys is subject to. And the curses in Deuteronomy 28 caters for almost any sickness or disease you can imagine in this world. Skin disease, tuberculosis, all kinds of things. Not just sicknesses and diseases, but shameful things. It says that whatsoever you lay your hands to do, it's cursed. It says that you will raise up children for somebody else to kidnap them. You say you will marry something, somebody else will take away your, your wife. In other words, it's saying even your marriages will not succeed. That's the curse. Now, Jesus took all those curses. How? By becoming the curse on the tree. So, how has he rewritten Deuteronomy 28? Deuteronomy 28, for you now, the way it's been rewritten is, if thou shalt believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, then all these blessings shall be unto thee, and all these curses shall be permanently deleted from your life. That's New Testament. That's New Testament. Now, what's the implication of this? The implication of this is that, oh, wait, 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 wait. Are you saying that what obtained in the Old Testament, which was Deuteronomy 28, is do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. That is what they call meritocracy. Is that, is that the right vocabulary? In other words, you merit what you deserve. You get what you deserve. In other words, if you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you... that's Old Testament. But right now, are you telling me? That's what the, the, I'm telling you what the New Testament is, the implication. Are you telling me now that if I just believe in Jesus, all I am guaranteed is good? You mean that the bad, the curses, has been permanently obliterated and blotted out from my destiny? Yes, that's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. And I can confirm that in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. God the Father has blessed you. Has blessed you. He has blessed you. With all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. How? Through Christ Jesus. Okay, okay Pastor Robert, thank you. Yeah, that's blessed. What about the curses? The Bible says Galatians 3.13. Christ hath redeemed you from the curse of the law. Any curse written in Deuteronomy, any curse written in Leviticus, any curse written in Numbers, any curse written in Exodus, you are absorbed from it. You are absorbed. In other words, the curse any basis for which a curse should come upon you has been invalidated, nullified, such that you are permanently free. See, you are not free because you are sinless. Listen to me carefully. You are not free from the curse because you are sinless. If you want to search for sins, any one of you here, there are several, over a thousand wrongs we can point out in your life but we are free from the curse because we are guiltless we are without guilt so you have been proclaimed as one without guilt you are guiltless you are guiltless why 